1960s, which is somewhat interesting, because you know you could say there's that whole metaphor, there's that symbology with Jesus being the kind of the beginning of the age of Pisces, and he cleans the apostles' feet. That's just an interesting like correspondence or analogy. And it, I mean, also I should mention the Rosicrucians were all mystical. They they were mystical Christians. So if you ever read Rosicrucian literature, they're always talking about the Christic force and. There. Although they talk about Sophia and Venus and nature a lot as well, but nonetheless, at their core, they are a type of, I want to call them just mystical, you could call them something like hermetic Christians. They're, they're, they're an odd bunch. But nonetheless, so to get into this idea, do we need any preparation? So there's this style of, style of magic or type of magic called sympathetic magic. <coughs> And the idea of sympathetic magic is that things in the world are similar to one another. And if there is a similarity, then there's a sympathy or a connection to. So, you know, if you ever like look in crystal books and you get things like, oh yeah, a ruby corresponds to Mars, that's not supposed to just be something exoteric, like, oh yeah, it's red. It's actually like a ruby in that sense is a condenser of Martian force or like a moonstone is a condenser of the lunar force, or gold specifically pulls solar forces towards it. So you get, in the medieval period especially, you get a kind of magicians and alchemists and uh, all of those occultists who start doing this style of ritual ceremonial magic called sympathetic magic, where they'll kind of deck out a room, in, like if they want to work with Saturn, they deck out a room with black drapes and they wear like a black robe and then they'd have like a specific seal of Saturn and they use black candles and then they'd use, you'd have a stone of onyx and maybe a le some lead on the altar or maybe you'd have like an incense burning as well. Incense is probably the most important addition to have. So I was going to say, although they do this and you know that collects a lot of Saturnian force for whatever ritual you want to do, you don't, we don't need to go to that extreme. One author I really liked to quote him, he once said that to do magic all you really need is uh, all you really need is a table, a candle, and faith. And I was like, oh, okay, that's quite interesting. So there's that. But if you do add anything to it, I mean, you can do the colored candles if you want, or if you, do, uh, if you are a crystal collector, you can put a specific crystal that corresponds to that sign on the altar to help make the practice more potent. Go right ahead. But the main thing that I would say that makes the practices the most potent would be the incense. If you gained an ins uh, the incense, like if you're doing the practice of Aries, you use myrrh, or if you're doing the practice of Leo, you use frankincense or spikenard for Aquarius or something like that, or something that smells, a potent smell. But it's like the scent is actually important. There's some esoteric connotations to scents, but incense in the end, I talked about blood being important. What does incense do? It's a smell. When you smell it, it goes into your lungs, and then through your lungs, it connects to your blood and then through your blood, so that in, it goes right directly into that blood. That co thing that is in correspondence, that is in sympathy with that force, goes directly into your blood. There's an intimacy there. So if you're working with these energies to unlock, to uh, release a gate, a seal, a filter, to let more force through into your body, then the incense would, I would be the, say, that is the most potent aspect. And you can find all of that information online. I want to mainly give the practices that uh, Crum Heller gives in his book to that connotation. And so, what are we doing in this practice? What we're doing is, is we're calling forth a great amount of light. We're calling forth celestial energy to come into us, to come down into us, and to crystallize into us. So, to maybe explain that via an analogy, you could say, like to use an alchemical analogy maybe I'll use. When you crystallize salt, in like, how do they crystallize salt in a fact? Because you know, you can have crystal salt, or you can just have powder salt. But the idea is, is you, know, you can do this experiment, you can go to the beach, get some seawater, let it evaporate, and you just get powdered salt, it's uh, low quality. But you can, hire the, you can actually crystallize that. And how you do that, you get a vat of water, or a small vial, vial or a cup of water, you put the salt powder in and let it, uh, let it uh, saturate into the water, so the powder disappears, it saturates into the water, the water becomes opaque. And you just keep doing that until the water is fully saturated, and then you either apply a flame and try to go for super saturation, or just the flame for a little while to give it a bit of a boil. 
and then you place, you can put like a ruler or a stick and tie a string to it, and you just lay it on top of the uh, cup or vessel, and let the string drop into the fluid. And then you just leave it there for like uh, two, three days or a week or something. And then when you come back and you pull up that stick, the, on the string that was in the liquid, crystals, salt crystals have crystallized on that string. So how that happens, that is what we're trying to do with this practice. What you are doing is you're, you are the alchemical vessel and you are trying to saturate yourself full of esoteric energy, full of celestial energy and terrestrial energy. And you're trying to have this mix and create an alchemical mixture within you. And then this eventually crystallizes. And what crystallizes? It crystallizes and you gain something. You gain something permanent. It's not just you're this physical body or, you know, and whatever, and you're like a consciousness, you actually gain, you could say, like another vehicle that your consciousness could then perhaps pilot and do other things with. Or more specifically, more important is that vehicle that you gain can then survive the ray of death. This is what a lot of the aim of, well, it's what the aim of alchemy was, immortality, was it not? This is, you could say, the esoteric side of immortality. The physical body may be discarded, but something remains. The consciousness becomes perpetual. You don't die and then reincarnate and forget everything. You die and you maintain yourself in a new world with a new body, completely new, the, bo the body of glory that they sometimes call it. So this is a very profound thing because it also connects to the idea of Rosicrucian masters who are in the astral, who guide us. It connects to the theosophical idea of the ascended masters who are also immortal masters that come over the world and help people. So you can be, it's, it's very profound if you really think about it, because it kind of like, it gives you this impression, like is this like the meaning of life? Is this, what is this world but like a garden bed and we're all seeds? This world is like a womb and we give, it gives birth to angels or demons, but we get to decide what we become in this sense. So without further ado, what are some of these practices? So we begin in Aries, and in the beginning of Aries, some, some of these practices I should mention are quite simple. They're very simple. So we begin in Aries, and it's merely a, it begins as merely as a visualization practice. And so you can sit down, and you just imagine the white light, the celestial force coming down into your cranium. And it's said that you use, Cromhella uh, mentions using head knots. So he, he says you nod the head seven times. So you nod the head seven times forwards while doing this practice. And you imagine the, that white light filling up just every single corner of the cranium. And then he says you nod the head backwards. So doing the same thing, imagining the light fill the cranium in the back. And then he says, you know, do some nods to the side and then to the other side. So you're filling all of the cavities of the head with this white light and it's condensing, it's filling up. It can even awaken a little bit of clairvoyance, perhaps. It's filling the head. It should activate, perhaps, even chakras. In the next, in to so that activates, that releases the, uh, the filter that opens the gate of Aries. And so that celestial force, which perhaps is just white light, it gets tinted with Aryan, Aryan, Aryan energy. And so the energy begins to, you know, uh, what do you, you call it, agitate and become kind of Aryan in its nature. But then it reaches the gate of Taurus. So Taurus being more Venusian, more solid, more slower, begins to slow it down. So, and we do these via the months, I should say. So you can do, I've done these before as a part of a, just a retreat. You can do these perhaps all in one day or all in one practice. But the potency of this is to make it a year long spiritual practice. So starting in the month of Aries, we do this every day in the uh, month of Aries. So you can make it a long kind of ritual practice with all this kind of thing, or, or you can just do like the head nods and imagine the white light coming and that should be enough. So then, so we do that in the month of Aries and then eventually in the month of Taurus, that white light that we've collected, we move it down into the throat. And it said the throat then, what is that? It's speech, it's the word, it's the logos. In the beginning, there was the word and the rules of God, or the Buddhists talk about the primordial Buddhas who sung the world into creation. The world has a prof the word has a profound mystery to it. 
So it said, here, here we mantralize. And it's, once again, it's Cromhello, the Western occultist, uses an Eastern mantra. He says, just use the mantra Aum. So in this, we are tinting that energy with a, a flavor of Taurus using the mantra Aum. And so we do this through the month of Taurus. Coming to the month of Gemini, it, it's, a little, it's quite a little bit interesting. It said that in Gemini specifically, like the masters of Mercury in the internal worlds, or masters in the internal worlds specifically try to help humanity to astrally project, or they come to us in the astral and try to help us, specifically in that month. And so it's said that in this month it's good to try and um, uh, try to do astral works. So for, Merc for um, Gemini, when we come to the month of Gemini, Gemini being the arms, yes, we imagine the light coming down into our arms and filling our arms and uh, filling all the way to the finger, fingertips. But he also recommends, he doesn't give necessarily a nod or a mantra or anything like that. He merely recommends to practice concentration and to concentrate on something before bed. Because concentrating on something before bed can then, uh, our desire to know about it can move us in the astral to that thing. So it's like, say, we're reading a book on Egypt, and then we start having a dream of Egypt. It's like we, spun, we kind of astral project to Egypt to try and find the place. Or if we, more specifically, we're saying, like, you know, you concentrate on maybe a god that you have an affinity with from a certain pantheon. Or I'm, remembered of, I'm reminded of stories of, like, there's one uh, very famous occultist called Eliphas Levi, or Eliphas Levi, if, you, if you're French, or however you want to pronounce his name. He has an interesting story with Paracelsus, the immortal, or the alchemist, I should just say. Eliphas Levy really liked uh, Paracelsus, and there's one story he has where he's like reading a Paracelsus book on his couch, and then he kind of falls to sleep, but then he has this astral experience with Paracelsus, and Paracelsus takes him out of his house into the market square and shows him like a medallion that has to do with like, it corresponds to the magician card or something. I was like, oh, okay. But it's this idea, it's like, you concentrate on something, and he, it said that you concentrate on something and breathe five times.